so we'll have a sprint uh, throughout the history of HTTP, and we'll be talking about the performance of this protocol. Um, so I'm Anna, Anna Balika on Twitter and other places. Um, I work for a London-based uh, agency called Potato. We build web and sometimes mobile apps. Um, even though I'll be talking about HTTP, I am not a network engineer. Uh, as said before, I am a back-end developer who's in a successful long-term relationship with Python and Django, a popular Python web framework. I know bits of Jess, mostly because there is no escape from it. HTTP 418 status code was defined in RFC 2324 uh, in 1998 on the 1st of April, and it's called Hypertext Coffee Pot Control Protocol. Later followed by an extension, uh, same protocol, but for ET efflux appliances, because we need a way to brew some tea. Um, it's not exactly a joke anymore since the boom of Internet of Things, because everything gets connected to the Internet, and HTTP plays some role in this. It was always baffling to me why the protocol is called hypertext, because it can transfer not only text, but all sorts of media. This is a misnomer, because the first implementation of HTTP could, in fact, transfer only text. In 1991, Tim Berners-Lee outlined some of the basics of many core components of the modern web, like HTML and HTTP. At the time, there was no RFC, no SPAC, but there was an implementation of a small subset of the protocol that became known as HTTP 0.9. So to make an HTTP 0.9 request, I had to shop around for a website, and I found stallman.org. To make a request, I used Telnet, that's the old way of SSHing when security wasn't really a concern. So I'm connected to the server. I make the request using the somewhat familiar syntax, so get plus the path. I hit enter, and straight away, the server responds with a dump of the page HTML, and finally closes the connection. Main features of HTTP 0.9 are the fact that the request is a single line, and always a single line, ASCII-based character string terminated with CRLF. It consists of words get, and get is the only method you can use, a space and the document address. Um, the response is a byte stream of ASCII text as well, marked up in HTML or plain text, if you wish. The response message um, is terminated by closing the connection by the server. Uh, metadata, mm, nope, no protocol version, no headers, nothing. And respectively, there is no content negotiation. Overall, lots of things are not there yet, but it was simple. It was simple to implement, simple, simple to get started, and so it took off. Right after HTTP 0.9, began, uh, works began on establishing a proper spec that became known as HTTP 1.0 in 1996. Forget about Telnet. Uh, let's use CURL and uh, fetch the home page of Twitter. So we connect to Twitter, we make a request, uh, get method plus the path to the resource, plus the protocol version and a bunch of request headers. We receive a response that is made of the response headers and the payload. Um, the response headers tell us the response status and a bunch of other things, like the content type. And the response is plain text HTML. After the end of the exchange, the connection is closed. There are lots of new shiny things introduced in HTTP 1.0. So requests may consist of um, multiple new line separated header fields. Ooh, revolution. Um, it also includes the protocol version. The response object has its own set of uh, new line separated header fields and is prefixed with a response status line. The connection between the server and the client is uh, still closed after every request. Response is not limited to hypertext anymore. You can send cat pictures. And a lot of things are defined by this spec. So there's uh, content, content encoding, uh, media type negotiation, character set support, proxy behaviors, caching, authorization, a bunch of things. Here's a w warning. Um, we'll be doing examples, timing how much does it cost us to do a certain request response exchange. And we'll be using fixed synthetic values, um, whereas in real world, networks continuously fluctuate. 
So let's assume our round trip is 30 milliseconds between the client and the server. So that's fairly low latency. Before making a request to, the, uh, to a resource, the client should establish a TCP connection using the TCP freeway handshake, the assumption that we're using HTTP on top of TCP. Um, the client sends a SYN package, send, send server response with a SYN acknowledge, client sends acknowledge, and to save doing an extra round trip together with ACK packages the GET request. Server spends some time processing the request, say in 35 milliseconds, and returns the response back. The connection is closed. As a whole, the TCP setup took one round trip, which is 30 milliseconds, and the HTTP bit took 65 milliseconds. For every single request made using HTTP 1.0, we should perform the freeway handshake, hence the overhead is always one round trip. Pages on the web rarely consist of a single resource. For example, Twitter.com homepage does 21 requests. So to see the whole of Twitter homepage using HTTP 1.0, I need to wait for two seconds. Assuming time to first byte is going to be lower, but it's still far from being instant. So according to HTTP archive, an average modern web page fetches 100 requests. So That'll make me wait for 9.5 seconds, and that's not a fun way to browse the web. But you know what? I actually lied to you. That request to Twitter.com was made over HTTPS, and with HTTPS, we not only have to perform the TCP freeway handshake, we also have to do the TLS handshake to establish a secure tunnel for communication. Um, only after all of that, the client and the server can start uh, sending what really matters to the user. So that concludes that in addition to the one round trip for TCP, a new TLS session will take whole two round trips. Um, that was to set up a new TLS session, but TLS sessions can be resumed. So in this case, we get one round trip for the TCP and one trip for session resumptions, and then application data. Good stuff. Uh, back to Twitter homepage and its 21 request, assuming that the first connection will perform the full TLS handshake, and for all consequent requests we use the TLS session resumptions, that will result in approximately 2.7 seconds. But for the average web page, that number rises to 12.5 seconds. Clearly, HTTP 1.0 isn't well fit for our modern needs. No surprise that after releasing HTTP 1.0, um, point zero RFC works began on um, HTTP 1.1 to satisfy the needs of the modern web. Um, it was developed over a period of roughly four years. Um, RFC 2068 was published in 1997, followed by an extension in 1999, RFC 2616. And this is what we have today. This is what we, our servers, our clients are most used to. This is the modern day web. So let's see URL to github.com. It's a GET request to the index page using the new protocol version plus the headers. And by the way, HTTP 1.1 clients must send the host header. Response status uh, OK. Um, and a bunch of headers. Notice the chunked transfer encoding and the cache control. These are new headers. Um, we receive the response payload bytes and leave the connection intact. Let's make another one. Uh, let's download GitHub's Octocat. I love it. Um, I've omitted the request since it's the same standard request plus, plus the range header. So the range one is the important bit. It's useful to uh, request range by, uh, ranges of bytes because of, uh, to determine, uh, for example, the geometry of the image so that you can um, um, have the initial layout of the page or to resume and continue a transfer or to read the tail of a growing object. So the server in this case responds with uh, 206 partial content. And if we inspect the response headers, uh, for example, the content range and content length, um, we can see that the client um, indeed got a range of bytes rather than the whole resource. And another interesting header here is the connection keep alive. Here comes the chunk of 1,025 bytes, and the connection is left intact. HTTP performance was boosted by many things, but special tribute should be paid to keep alive connections. Also, with HTTP 1.1, we have compression and chunked responses and byte ranges. 
also pipelining, which helps the parties to break from the strict request response cycle. And we'll be talking about that uh, a bit later. So there's no more pragma. There's much better flexible caching mechanisms to improve performance. There are 24 new status codes, uh, like the one we've seen 206 partial content. And we got cookies because we wanted to make our apps stateful. Remember the TCP freeway handshake? Well, with Keep Alive connection on, which, by the way, is by default on, we do the handshake once, and then we can reuse the connection and request multiple resources. So we pay the penalty of TCP handshake only once until the connection is closed due to timeout or other reasons. And this is an incredible gain. Going back to our synthetic network cal calculations and assuming, again, that we're making the request to Twitter homepage, now using HTTP 1.1 with, with TLS handshake for the first connection and TLS session resumption for all consequent requests. To fetch 21 requests, it takes 1.5 seconds compared to 2.7. And if, does, if this doesn't look impressive, take a look at a page with 100 resources. Time to fetch went down from 12.5 seconds to 6.5. That's roughly 50% increase in speed for secure requests from HTTP 1.0 to 1.1. To be noted again, this is a synthetic calculation, and real-world examples may vary, giving worse or maybe better performance. In reality, we're not waiting for 6.5 seconds to load an average page. Reason being, browsers are not simple socket management apps. They do a lot of things, and they do them in the smartest way possible. Browsers open multiple simultaneous connections per domain. The magic number is six, but it can vary based on the browser and your settings. Using the waterfall model in the network tab, we can see how the six requests are dispatched in parallel. This clustering of connection requests can be seen better if we sort by priority. Browsers will request the HTML document, start passing it from top to bottom, discovering resources. And top priorities are CSS and then JavaScript, because rendering of the page is going to be blocked by them. So obviously, images are of least concern. As said before, HTTP pipelining is a mechanism that lets us break out of the strict first in, first out order. So after the TCP handshake, the client can request multiple resources at once. So it makes a request to the index page and to the JS res uh, resource. And it gets the responses back. Um, why? Because pipelining allows dispatching requests early without having to wait for the response to come back and hence make better use of server time and drop the overall latency. This sounds great, right? Um, wondering why it's disabled by default in browsers? Well, parallel processing on the server introduces uh, all sorts of implications because of the strict serialization of responses. Say, if, we're if the server is processing the HTML document and it takes a long time, then it can block all the other resources after it. And this is called head-of-line blocking. It's similar to the TCP idea of head-of-line blocking. Let's talk headers. Um, HTTP headers are textual. The average request will have um, 700 to 800 bytes of headers. But if you're hungry for cookies, it can explode to up to two kilobytes. This doesn't seem much, but an overhead for every single request response will have this. On top of that, even though we perform compression on the response payload, headers will remain uncompressed. So think twice before adding that cookie. Bundling and minimization are second nature to us. From uh, make files, uh, grunt, gulp, broccoli, and now webpack, we put everything in one big file and try to make it as small as possible. Based on the learnings of how HTTP works, assuming on top of TCP, it makes a lot of sense. We minimize because the fastest byte is the byte not sent, we concatenate because we reduce so much protocol overhead. It's like doing pipelining, but at the application level. Reducing the number of total requests is one of the best performance optimizations. There are downsides, obviously. We introduce extra complexity and start flame wars on which tool is the best for the job. We deliver worse. Uh, cache performance and execution speed, of, execution speed of the page. Often, a page might download 
tens of extra kilobytes that it doesn't need. And when either of those um, changes, um, the whole cache is invalidated. Moreover, if the bundle is too big, the page rendering is blocked because the browser can't execute partially fetched uh, JS responses. Spriting is another one of those hacks. This is a sprite that I took from Amazon homepage. Um, fetching each tiny resource separately would be a lot more expensive. But don't fool yourself that sprites come for free. They bring similar issues, certain complexity in creating them, potential caching problems, and the browser has to keep the whole image in memory and kind of use it like this. Everyone started talking about HTTP because of HTTP2 version. Uh, the basis of HTTP2 is uh, SPDI or SPDI, an experimental protocol developed at Google that had the goal of reducing the latency of web pages, uh, minimizing the cost of deployment complexity, and avoiding changes in um, network infrastructure, because that ain't happening soon. So in 2015, ISG approved HTTP2 and HPAC drafts, but the work is still ongoing. And so HTTP2, or how the cool kids call it, H2, is full of wonders. If I were to do a CRL request, a CRL client, in fact, can do uh, HTTP2 request, then for the outside observer, not much would have changed. It's the same request response, uh, exchange, headers, uh, status codes, keep alive connection. To understand the changes, we need to look at a slightly more low level, so analyze the packets. Once you're able to decrypt uh, the traffic in Wireshark and filter by H2 traffic, we can see new types of packets, which HTTP2 actually calls them a frame. So I can see um, there's a window update and settings and headers. It looks very exciting. And then I can look at the decompressed header data. And we can already decipher the well-known headers. The key difference between HTTP2 and its predecessor is that it is binary instead of textual, and it introduces a binary framing layer. Because of that, it allows multiplexing of requests and responses. It also can do server push, in other words, push resources proactively without the need for the client to request those. Similarly to how HTTP does flow control, now H2 can do flow control as well, but at the application level. And due to multiplexing, uh, we require only one single connection per origin. H2 also uses header compression to reduce the overhead. Binary framing layer is the key to lots of features that are now possible in H2. It is incompatible with previous, version, previous versions of HTTP, hence the version increment. Unlike HTTP 1, where the headers and the payload are new lines separated plain text, H2 messages are encapsulated in a specific way, and each frame is binary encoded. So there are 10 different types of frames, which are pretty much self-explanatory. There's headers to send headers, there's data to send the payload, settings to negotiate configuration, parameters, ping to measure minimal round trip, go away, I like the go away, to initiate, to initiate shutdown of the connection, and others. So multiplexing, in essence, means allow multiple <coughs> request and response messages to be in flight at the same time. In contrast, having a strict send a request, wait for the server to do the processing, receive the response, send another request. How does it work? Imagine that the whole canvas is one single connection. One connection can carry multiple streams. Streams are virtual, bidirectional channels for communication that roughly translate to a request response exchange. Each stream can carry a number of messages, messages identified to a stream via a stream identifier. Um, messages themselves are composed of frames, so for example, headers and data frames. And that's pretty much it. While the client might be sending a message to the server, the server might be sending response messages, which in this case is a minimum of two streams, but there could be many more, which enables interleaving requests and responses in parallel without blocking on any of them. In a world of a plethora of streams, we need stream prioritization. Each stream may have a weight and be dependent on another stream. In concept, it is 
somewhat similar to the priority we see in the browser web tools, but a lot more flexible. And due to multiplexing at the application level, TCP, uh, the TCP flow control isn't granular enough. So to be able to not overwhelm the client or the server, in HTTP flow control, each receiver can set desired window size for each stream, or even the connection, and then it can increment or decrement it. Push promise. If a client requests an HTML document, doesn't it make sense to also want to get other page resources as well? Well, say a client requests an HTML document and the server preps the response, but it also initiates streams for push promise frames for other resources. It is important important that the push promise frames reach the client earlier than the proper response. Otherwise, the client might initiate re requests for responses it discovers in the HTML response and thus creating duplication. Once the frames reach the client, it can either accept them, yep, I need them, uh, do nothing, or reject the promises. Uh, for example, the client has them in the cache. Remember we said that HTTP headers represent an overhead, especially with lengthy cookies. Um, well, in H2, this is sold using HBAC, a compression format specifically designed for HTTP headers. The secret formula for reducing the number of bytes on the wire using, um, used for representing HTTP headers is the following. A static index table with 61 most commonly used HTTP headers, a dynamic table that is populated with new headers for the duration of the connection, and the headers that are not indexed are encoded using static Huffman encoding, using a code statistically obtained on a large sam sample of HTTP headers. Say we're making our first request, and this is the list of all the headers. Without HBAC, we would just send all of them as is. With HBAC, the common headers found in the static table, these are marked in green, will be encoded with one byte. So there's method get, scheme HTTPS, path, user, user agent, cookie. All of these are used very often. All the leftovers marked in black are encoded using Huffman code. In addition to that, the key value pairs of, header, of headers that were just encoded using Huffman will also be appended to the dynamic table, saving the cookie in the index table can save precious bytes for all subsequent requests. So when the second request comes in with its own set of headers, we do the following. We encode using the static table. These are all the headers marked in green. We encode using the dynamic table, all the headers marked in blue due to the previous values that we have saved in it. And the rest is encoded using Huffman code. This kind of compression can reduce anywhere from 30 to 80% of header bytes. Taking all of our previous best practices slash hacks, uh, how do they translate in the world of H2? So due to multiplexing, we no longer need six connections per origin. One single connection is enough. Hence, domain sharding used in past to allow more than six connections to uh, be used to fetch resources on a web page doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, inlining critical resources also might not be necessary because of multiplexing and push promise, plus we can cache those resources. Naive concatenation of static assets. Mm. Bundled assets result in more expensive uh, cache invalidation, delayed execution, and unnecessary transfers for some pages. But smart concatenation is still useful because A, data might be better compressed when bundled, and B, even though requests are cheap, they still carry some overhead. Similar idea for images, your app needs to find the right balance between put it all in one bin versus spawn 100 requests for each tiny resource. What still makes sense in the world of H2? There are lots of evergreen optimizations. You should have a fine-tuned TCP stack, smart caching, make use of e-tags, use CDNs because placing servers geographically closer to your user reduces the round trip time. Don't send unnecessary resources. Extra latency for no real reason is not fun. Always compress, regardless of the HTTP version. Compression reduces the number of bytes we put on the wire. And if possible, reduce header bytes. Mostly think cookies, but also hooray for HBAC. 
Here are are some statistics. So this is a chart replicated from a presentation given by Patrick Hammond on HTTP2. He shared some stats on the impact of latency and different HTTP versions on the financialtimes.com website. As we can see, for users with low latency, say 100 milliseconds or even 200 milliseconds, the benefit of switching to H2 isn't enormous. HTTP2 truly shines for users with high latencies where the difference becomes significant. Think 400, 500 and more. If you're thinking that Financial Times is a one-off example and that most traffic is not yet served using H2, well, Firefox stats shared in February this year at FOSDEM can prove you wrong. If looking at all of the traffic, then only 30% of it is served using H2. If taking into account only HTTPS traffic, because deploying H2 over HTTP2 is currently disabled in browsers, then it's 60%. Reason being that top visited websites are Google, Twitter, and Facebook, and uh, these guys uh, serve partially or entirely uh, their, their pages using H2. Whereas if taking into consideration the top 110 uh, million websites, then only 12% are served using H2. I think this is still impressive. More on the HTTP2 stats. So Fastly did a presentation on some interesting insights into HTTP2 testing HTTP1 versus 2 in different scenarios. I've extracted two of them. So these are test results for serving a website in Firefox with uh, 5 to 1 megabits per second, 40 millisecond second, uh, millisecond latency, and zero packet loss. So the website loads faster over HTTP2, HTTP1 lagging behind. And this matches our expectations. Same test, but now with 2% packet loss, HTTP2 performs poorly. The page loads faster over HTTP1. Why is that? Even though HTTP2 eliminates head of line blocking at the application level, it still exists at the transport label, hello TCP. HTTP1 performs better mainly because it's using six connections instead of one in the browser. This is where Quick comes into the spotlight. Uh, it is an experimental transport layer built over UDP that very much resembles TCP plus TLS plus HTTP2 implementation. This is a step forward to eliminate head of line blocking at the transport layer. And um, we are yet to see the finished drafts and maybe it's widespread adoption sometime in the future. If you want to learn more, I highly recommend High Performance Browsing Network uh, networking by Ilya Grigoric. And that's it. Thank you.